So we're going to start out with uh, what does marine planning mean to people? And the first thing we're going to do is a quick poll to kick things off. Um, so I think one of my colleagues will pop a poll up for you now. And we're going to ask you using one word only, what does marine planning mean to you? Um, your responses should pop up um, in a word cloud. I'll just wait for some people to type in. <laughs> Perfect. So we've got management to start. Oh, great. Loads of, loads of things. So we've got sustainability, sustainable, conservation, prioritization, protection, got spatial there, collaboration. Yeah, wait for some more to come in. Balance. We'll give a couple of minutes in case there's any more coming in. Cool. So, I mean, the, the biggest one there is coming up with management. Um, so, uh, Scotland sees our uh, make up around 61% of the UK marine area. And this vast area is getting busier every year as we continue to rely heavily on our seas. Scotland seas are essential to supporting how we as a population survive and thrive. For example, by providing resources to sustain us through fisheries, aquaculture, shipping and renewable energy development as well as healthy and vibrant marine and coastal habitats to enjoy for well-being, culture and recreation. I can see there's loads more responses coming in now for the word cloud, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, so how do we make sure that all these activities can happen simultaneously without causing harm to our marine environment? We use marine planning to identify what activities need to happen to provide resources and jobs and where they are best suited to avoid causing any harm. To do this, ministers and officials working in the Scotland Directorate collect evidence and information through strict assessment processes and work closely with local stakeholders to ensure the needs of people are considered. Because of the strategic nature of marine planning, it can be challenging to associate the different planning decisions back to the everyday uses of the marine environment. However, without marine planning activities, marine users may encounter increased conflicts over the use of the same space, as well as dwindling resources or damage to the marine environment, which would significantly affect our reliance on Scotland and seas for our well-being and prosperity. Um, yep, next slide. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to provide some context on marine planning in Scotland and also the National Marine Plan, just in case anybody is new here. Um, and I apologise if you've uh, heard this before, it's familiar to some of you already. Um, so marine planning matters in Scotland's inshore waters, which are out to 12 nautical miles, are governed by the Marine Scotland Act 2010. And in its off offshore waters, which is 12 to 200 nautical miles, by the UK Marine and Coastal Access Act 2009. These are commonly referred to as the Marine Acts. Marine Scotland Directorate undertakes national marine planning activities in accordance with the requirements and conditions set out in these Marine Acts. Marine planning activities often result in the creation of a plan, a strategy or a framework. These are then used to guide the decisions on how, when and by whom certain activities can be undertaken in the marine environment. In Scotland, marine planning activities are undertaken nationally, regionally and for specific sectors. To date, marine planning activities in Scotland have resulted in a statutory national marine plan, three draft regional marine plans, and a sectoral, sectoral marine plan for offshore wind. Um, Scotland's National Marine Plan, which is also referred to as the NMP, was adopted in 2015 after the passage of the Marine Acts. It's a statutory document that all relative authorities must follow with some exceptions. The plan provides the overarching policy framework to guide decisions on how Scotland's marine space is used and translates UK level ambitions, which are set out in the UK Marine Policy Statement, into policy and spatial guidance for regional and sectoral marine planning. Marine Scotland Director undertakes spatially explicit planning for specific marine sectors, including offshore wind and innovation in targeted oil and gas or INTOG decarbonisation. Um, the Marine Scotland Act 2010 also enables planning for the marine regions to be delegated to marine planning partnerships or MPPs. Marine Scotland Directorate supports these regional MPPs made up of local stakeholders who reflect marine interests in their region and encourage local ownership and decision making about specific issues within their respective areas. 
Three marine planning partnerships have been established to date for which regional marine plans are being drafted, and these are Orkney, Shetland and Clyde. This is out of a total of 11 Scottish marine regions. No adopted regional marine plans are currently in place, however. Um, the Marine Act sets out a requirement for a statutory review of a national marine plan every three years. So since 2015, NMP has been reviewed in 2018 and 2021. The 2018 review focused on the effectiveness of the plan. It found that the number of policies and the general aspects of the NMP were effective or useful to decision making. It also noted that there were some challenges to the implementation of national marine plan policies, including those caused by the uncertainty around the UK exit from the EU. The second 2021 review examined the effectiveness of NMP in light of other relevant matters. These include the global climate emergency, COVID-19 pandemic, UK exit from the EU, and the implications of wider Scottish government strategies, such as the blue economy approach, future fisheries management strategy, and our legal commitment to achieve net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases by 2045. The 2021 review therefore concluded firstly that NMP remains effective, but could benefit from an improved evaluation framework. And secondly, the review of relevant matters impacting the NMP points strongly to the need to replace it to better address these emerging issues. As a result, Scottish ministers announced their intention to update and replace the existing NMP in Parliament in October 2022 and via commitment in the Scottish Government's Programme for Government 2022-2023. So the objective and vision for NMP2, uh, based on the recommendations of the 2018 and 2021 reviews, the purpose of National Marine Plan 2 will be to address the global climate and nature crises by carefully managing increased competition for space and resources in the marine environment. The second National Marine Plan must deliver a new policy framework for licensing and consenting decisions that better reflects the evolving environmental conditions, accounts for sustainable use, as well as policy development since 2015. And it must account for increasing demands on marine space, aiming to balance existing and emerging issues. It will also help to de uh, deliver Scottish Government priorities, such as the outcomes set up in the Blue Economy Vision, Net Zero Targets and a Just Transition. NMP2 will help deliver against a number of work streams flowing from the Blue Economy Vision, including the management of sustainable food production industries, such as fisheries and aquaculture. And additionally, the NMP2 will contain policies and objectives to accelerate the achievement of the Scottish Government's net zero commitment and to protect and enhance biodiversity in line with national and global targets. NMP2 will align with ambitions set out in our wider Scottish Government policy, including the review of the current sectoral marine plan for offshore wind, Scotland's National Planning Framework 4, Infrastructure Investment Plan for Scotland, National Islands Plan, Climate Change Plan 2018 to 2032, and the UK Energy Security Strategy, among others. Um, yep, yeah, next slide, please. Perfect. So um, the development of a new national marine plan is ongoing and it will be a multi-year process. This is the indicative timeline for major milestones. We are currently in the first stage of the timeline. where We are working to develop objectives for NMP2. Um, we're doing this by undertaking an appraisal of existing Scottish and UK government commitments and identifying priority objectives for the NMP2 to deliver. This is being done with the support of an internal policy working group to ensure that all relevant policy areas are accurately reflected in NMP2 and will be informed by extensive stakeholder input throughout, which my colleague Emily will talk to you about in a little bit more detail. Additionally, we are in the process of writing and preparing a scoping report in-house for the strategic environmental assessment and planning for other statutory and additional assessments, which I will go on to um, talk about a bit more next. Um, we anticipate a draft NMP2 will be prepared and ready for statutory public consultation in summer 2024, and we anticipate the adoption of NMP2 in autumn winter 2025. So under the Marine and Coastal Access Act, NMP2 will be subject to a sustainability appraisal to assess social, economic and environmental impacts of the plan. 
This report will summarize the conclusions of the Strategic Environmental Assessment, which is required under the Environmental Assessment Scotland Act, the Habitats for Regulation Appraisal required under Habitats Regulations, and the Social and Economic Impact Assessment. These assessments will test the potential impacts of the proposed policies and objectives contained within the draft plan on various environmental and socioeconomic receptors and European protected sites and their features. Uh, these assessments will be done externally in parallel to the plan and policy development process. This means that the results of the assessments will shape the development of final policies. For example, if a policy is found to have a significant negative impact, we will work to either make changes to the policy or identify suitable mitigation measures to address the impacts. If positive impacts are identified, ways to increase the positive effects of plan policies will be suggested. We will also develop uh, monitoring measures for any impacts identified throughout the process. Each of these draft assessments and sustainability appraisal report will be available for comment alongside the draft plan during the statutory consultation period. In addition to this appraisal, we will also be undertaking a series of other assessments internally, each required by specific legislation, with several of these to be informed by the socioeconomic impact assessment. This will include an island community's impact assessment, uh, which looks at how the impacts of the plan may be felt differently in island communities compared to those in the Scottish mainland, a business and regulatory impact assessment, testing the impact of plan policies on relevant businesses, and a qualities impact assessment to determine if the plan policies will have discriminatory or differential impacts on those with protected characteristics and a child's rights and well-being assessment to identify any impacts on children's human rights and well-being. So um, the SEA, as previously mentioned, focuses on assessing the likely environmental impacts of the proposed plan and policies and objectives and this should begin at an early stage of the plan development and preparation. Scoping is the first step we are undertaking in the process and it allows us to determine the level of detail to be covered in the assessment and begin consideration of likely environmental effects. We are undertaking scoping work within the Marine Scotland Directorate and as part of scoping we will produce a scoping report. This will identify the environmental topics to be taken into consideration during the SEA explain the broad policy context and environmental baseline for the plan, outline the proposed broad assessment methods, and identify the timing and length of the consultation period for the SEA environmental report and the draft plan, as well as the other assessments previously detailed. The SEA scoping report will be consulted on over um, summer this year. The report will be sent to the statutory consultation authorities and will also be made available, available for wider public consultation. Comments received on the SEA scoping report will help to enhance the assessment process and feed into the work done to produce the environmental report. So you've probably heard enough of my voice now, so I'm going to pass on to Emily, who's going to provide more details on our stakeholder engagement. Great. Thank you, Danny. So, um, hi everybody. I'm Emily Breeden, and I'm the stakeholder engagement officer for the new national marine plan. So, when it was announced that a new uh, national marine plan was going to be developed, we also published our stakeholder engagement strategy and statement of public participation. So, our vision for the stakeholder engagement process of NMP2 is that everyone who uses, relies on, or has an interest in Scotland's seas has the opportunity to inform decision making in the marine space. So the strategy guides the way that we plan and deliver our stakeholder engagement, as we want to ensure it's inclusive, targeted and transparent. Um, so alongside the NMP2 announcement, we created a stakeholder survey as a way to widen our reach. So initially, this survey was to gain feedback on stakeholders experience of the first NMP process. But now, as we've moved on, we've edited it to be more of a, main, a mailing list sign up and we've managed to really grow our database from this. We then use this mailing list to send out our first NMP2 update by email last month, uh, which reached many stakeholders across a wide range of sectors, as well as the general public. The QR code is Sorry, slightly some more people in. The QR code is on the screen uh, just now and the mailing list link is in the chat box in case you haven't signed up yet. And please feel free to pass this on to people you might think would be interested in NMP2 updates. 
So we're always trying to look for new ways to deliver interactive engagement with stakeholders and the public. So for example, over the past few months, we've delivered interactive workshops using the Marine Spatial Planning Board Game with many stakeholders, including East Grampian Coastal Partnership and students from the University of Glasgow and Aberdeen. So as you can see in the photo on the screen, the board game is made up of three local authorities and the players are given roles of marine planners, nature conservation advisors and sector representatives. Players must work together to achieve their objectives of creating a regional marine plan against hypothetical budget cuts and resolving cross-border and sector conflicts. <clears throat> More people in. Um, the feedback from stakeholders has been positive and you can see a quote from a student from the University of Glasgow about how much they enjoyed playing the game. Okay, so finally, we have identified young people as a key stakeholder group that we want to engage with during the development of NMP2, as they were previously underrepresented. This is due to existing Scottish Government commitments, and we want to encourage young people to participate in legislation that impacts them. So our main aim here is to educate young people with the relevant knowledge so then they have the confidence to participate in the official NMP2 draft consultation. To deliver this, we've developed strategic partnerships with environmental organisations who work with young people as a way to use existing communication channels to them. Our future milestones um, include having young people represented and involved at our events, as well as some more bespoke engagement with young people. Uh, yeah, so as I said, our ultimate objective is to have young people officially participate in the NMP2 draft consultation, and we will share um, more details of our engagement with young people in our next email update, which will hopefully be around June sometime. So we have many opportunities for stakeholders uh, to get involved with. We're currently in the process of establishing a steering group of stakeholders that will provide us with feedback and technical advice, primarily on the sustainability appraisal and associated assessments, as well as draft plan policies. So the steering group will be asked to facilitate access to required data and evidence and provide feedback on project outputs, such as assessment scope and methodologies. For the steering group, we carefully selected stakeholders who would be able to offer the more technical advice required for these assessments. Um, so to guarantee balanced representation, we selected stakeholders across a wide range of sectors. To ensure the transparency of this group, we'll be publishing the minutes of each steering group meeting on our Scottish Government website. And a link to these minutes will be included in our email updates. So we invite stakeholders to review them and pass on any comments or feedback via email. The first meeting of the steering group, where we will be presenting and seeking comment on the draft of the Strategic Environmental Assessment Scoping Report, is planned to take place um, next week, actually. The draft of the scoping report will also be made available for public consultation, so all stakeholders will be able to review and provide feedback. Um, the, exact, the exact timing of this consultation is still to be confirmed, but we anticipate it will be during the summer. And again, this will be... Um, made available to you in our email updates. So yeah, as I mentioned, the steering group um, primarily is for the more sort of technical advice and assessments, but we have other engagement opportunities for all stakeholders to get involved in. So for example, we will be delivering our National Marine Planning Forum, which will be a series of three events hosted in different locations in Scotland to bring together a wide range of stakeholders. But I will just go into more detail in a minute about that. And finally, during the consultation period of the draft NMP2, we will deliver a roadshow of engagement events across Scotland, providing access for a range of stakeholders and communities to review and provide input and feedback that we can then use during the consultation analysis. And we will, of course, be delivering ad hoc engagement throughout this process when um, we have the capacity and opportunities to do that. Okay, so yeah, as I mentioned, we'll be hosting our first event at the National Marine Planning Forum, a cross-sectoral stakeholder engagement platform on the 15th of June this year. So the forum's goal is to help inform stakeholders about the broader picture of NMP2 development and to provide a natural space to exchange ideas and information, allowing for a shared understanding of interests and priorities among stakeholders and officials. We aim to minimise stakeholder fatigue by providing an opportunity to discuss additional marine planning aspects with a wider focus, such as regional or sectoral marine planning, and to help stakeholders understand how NMP2 fits within a bigger picture of the blue economy approach. 
This will be a hybrid event hosted in person in Edinburgh and live streamed online. Uh, we want to ensure our engagement is inclusive and transparent by making it publicly available online where the audience will be able to submit comments, feedback and questions. So we will post the two links in the chat where you can register your interest in attending in person or virtually. Um, but just please be aware that spaces to attend in person are very limited. And if interest is high, we can't guarantee you an in-person space. Um, but you will, however, still have the opportunity to attend virtually. Okay, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, mm -mm. So I'm going to introduce you now to David Pratt, Head of Marine Planning and Policy Division here at Marine Scotland, um, who will be leading on answering your questions during our Q&A. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please just feel free to post them in the chat box or um, you can use the raise your hand function uh, and I'll ask you to come off mic and introduce yourself and ask a question. So is there any questions at the moment? Oh, there's surely one. <laughs> there's surely one out there. There's one in the chat. You hey. know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, there are cases ah, as we tried. Oh, well, let me. I'll... Oh, yeah. Okay. Do you want to answer <laughs> the first one, Emily? Um, so. The agenda for the forum is still being developed at the minute. Um, so unfortunately, we can't give too much detail at the minute, um, but we will be sending um, an agenda, a very detailed agenda to everyone that signed up um, in the next few weeks. So sorry, it can't be much clearer at the moment. Um, Super. Do you want me to kick in, Emily? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll take Sinead's first. Sinead, um, is there any specific aspects of the SEIA, SEIA process that you are um, looking for? Hi, David. Uh, thanks. So I guess I was just sort of wondering about it as it seems a kind of relatively newer assessment compared to the other assessment processes. And I think the slide said it was kind of interacting um, with things like the island impact assessment. Um, so I was just wondering what the linkages were there and, and kind of overall view on what the process would entail. Yeah, I mean, the, the last National Marine Plan obviously had some of the economic assessment and um, alongside the BRIA as well. Um, there'll obviously be the kind of broad SEI process when we've looked at um, some of the impacts of policies on existing sea users uh, and, and other stakeholders and that type of thing. And and yeah, the, the kind of impact, the island assessment is obviously quite a, a relatively new concept. And that, but that will be kind of factored in when we get into some of the um, spatial analysis work that might come forward um, within the process. So if you if you regionally cut, um, for example, uh, your assessment uh, in the way that there has been, and then I'm not saying this is what will happen, but in the sectoral planning process, you've got certain regions around Scotland, you can then kind of disaggregate that and obviously disaggregate the impacts, and obviously um, there's that that ability to bring out some of that data which applies to the kind of island regions. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, Shona's question. Uh, Shona, it will be signed off um, once the, obviously, the ministers decide to um, sign it off, so to speak. So it, it's still kind of working its way through that process. Uh, and that's where we kind of um, currently are in, in that regard. Uh, and I'll go on to um, uh, Fiona's question. Um, the NMP2 consultation, I mean, the, the people with long memories will remember the kind of Planning Scotland Seas consultation, um, where a lot of um, initiatives kind of ran in parallel. Um, and I'm not sure that will happen quite like that this time around, but the main thing is that um, anything that comes forward to, to be consulted upon with the National Marine Plan um, to uh, is obviously um, reflective of what's coming through the HMPMA um, process 
as well, um, and, and, and kind of vice versa uh, to that extent. So it's, it's really just ensuring us kind of close working within Marine Scotland and, and kind of join up in those two issues. Uh, I see Sean as again, uh, again, this will be subject to um, obviously the ministerial um, sign off and you'll obviously be working with Fiona um, in that regard as to how that is um, being taken forward. Yeah, let's come in. Next. There's what one from next? Jessica. So what is the next marine region to develop a uh, regional marine plan and will NMP2 impact the regional marine planning process? Uh, in terms of the next uh, region to come forward, um, I mean, this will be most likely uh, there, there's potential for the, the um, Western Isles region. Uh, I think previously there's been an, an intimation that that, that um, that may be the next kind of island group, but it's still at a very, 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 very early stage. And more broadly, the dynamic with the NMP2 and the regional marine planning process is something we'll try and explore a wee bit further within the NMP um, processes that develops. This plays into the, the, the kind of broader themes around um, kind of spatial definition of the national marine plan. Uh, do we move more to the kind of model of um, the kind of NPF where, where regional priorities are established and that, that, that offers then regional plans wider scope to sit um, and alongside that. But again, th these are the types of questions that ultimately as the process develops, um, there'll be a, a lot more kind of exploration um, within that as to, to that balance and, and the kind of relationship between the, uh, the, the existing regimes. Thanks, David. So, Graham Russell has his hand up. So, Graham, would you like to just come with Mike and introduce yourself with your question? Uh, <coughs> Hello, David. Everybody knows me. I'm uh, Graham Russell from Royal Yachting Association Scotland. I guess I'm part of the tourism and recreational sector. Our experience with the energy strategy consultation and the HPMA one was that lot of uh, small businesses and groups were not able to get involved till absolutely the last minute. Um, these are, and I don't imagine from my experience of the first NMP that this will be any simpler than that. It might be a good idea to have a chat at some point how we can work together to minimise the, uh, uh, the workload on people who really do need to have a say. Totally agree, Graham. Um, a, a advantage we have this time around is we have Emily and Olga um, as well, who are kind of a designated stakeholder engagement resource, and we, we are well aware of the need to, to bring in as broad an array of stakeholders as possible to the process. So having a chat and actually coming up with ways that you think this can be done more effectively we would wholeheartedly agree on. Yeah, I could, I could produce a list of people, I think, and, and, and ways in which we could... We could uh, develop that. Super. Uh, Christoph. Yeah, David, hello. Um, Christoph Harwood from Simply Blue, um, Blue Economy Project Developer. What we often see, we develop wind farms and other, other activities in the blue economy, and often there's elements of conflict between the different sectors. Now, this is an opportunity for collaboration. Um, a lot of consultations is people like yourselves listen, collect, come back and, and assess and then go back out again. Is there going to be opportunity to get people who might at times be in conflict in the same room? So actually they can be part of finding solutions together rather than yourselves taking on, on that burden yourselves. Uh, yeah, I, I, as with the previous processes, there'll be quite an intense period, an intense kind of um, programme of stakeholder engagement events when we would look to try and get multiple stakeholders into the same room. We obviously are intending to get um, a, a very reflective um, group of stakeholders within the project steering group, which can help um, steer some of the issues that you're seeing. Uh, and then kind of more broadly, at the kind of strategic level, we're starting to see initiatives from the UK government around the kind of marine prioritisation project, which will probably in some, to some degree be reflected um, within uh, the National Marine Plan. I think there's a, a fair recognition that uh, the competition for space is um, ever increasing 
um, out, out in the Scotland seas, and in that regard, offering clarity around conflict resolution and coexistence. And um, we want to do as much possible with this um, initiative um, as we can. And I suppose what I'm suggesting is that getting some of us in a room together to discuss those issues and having that opportunity to find that exact compromise together would, would be useful. Yeah, um, again, um, when, it, when it gets into these types of issues, we'd be more than happy to um, engage as appropriate there. Um, and uh, yeah, by all means, uh, drop an email to myself or the team with, with some thoughts that you have on, on maybe more of the specifics and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can um, get involved with there. Thanks a lot. I think in There's relation... a question. Oh, sorry. Oh, on your way, Emily. Oh, no. I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, just, yeah, a uh, question from Catherine. Will the NMP reflect the requirements of NPF4 relating to climate change and nature? I don't know. Catherine, have you got um, some more kind of specifics on that? Because obviously the, the, the kind of climate change is obviously a big driver within the NPF4. We've got kind of broader climate change uh, action plans and that type of thing type of thing coming forward. I mean, ultimately, we will be in alignment with the NPF4, um, as the NPF4 should be with the NMP2 um, or the NP... Uh, um, but yes, net gain, um, that will undoubtedly be an issue in which um, there will be a um, more than just a kind of passing reference to. I think when we're starting to look at some of the um, challenges with the renewables programme, the idea of impact and overall net gain is, is one which is, is well recognised at a UK level now. Uh, and um, yeah, I suspect the kind of any enabling framework for some of these initiatives coming forward um, will, will be reflected within that. And obviously there'll be quite close working with um, Michael McLeod's team and, and the other kind of environmental teams in Marine Scotland who are kind of in this space as well. Are there any more questions? David, do you have anything you'd like to say? Uh, I, I bother to a lot of issues that have been raised. I don't, I don't think I do. Um, it's obviously very early the, the process, but I would say it's, it's really, really encouraging to see so many people on the, the webinar today. And a big part of this will actually be ensuring we've got as, as many views and opinions um, reflected um, within this programme as possible. So uh, a definite thank you for me for all taking the time. And of course, if anyone wants to get in touch individually, uh, please do so with the team and, and we can discuss any kind of issues that have arose or, or things that you believe um, we should be focusing on because it's very, very important that stakeholders get involved uh, moving forward.